Hi everyone, welcome to an intuitive introduction to multinomial models. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about five specific things. First, I'm going to talk about when we should use multinomial models, just like I do with before introducing any method that I like to teach. We'll talk about why you can't just use a linear regression, or why you could or couldn't in this case. I'll talk about what a multinomial logit model is. It's going to turn out to be a straightforward extension of the binary logit model, which we covered in the fall. I'll go over the intuition of the model, as well as giving you the mathematical foundations of the model. Then we'll talk about how to estimate a multinomial model, in particular using Stata, what testing involves, and what kinds of things you might want to test in the context of a multinomial model and how you might do that in Stata. And I'll talk about how to predict, um, how to use the multinomial model to predict probabilities for particular events given a set of X's or characteristics. The multinomial logit model is built on top of a very important and not always obvious assumption. It's called independence of irrelevant alternatives. And we'll talk about what that means, uh, why in some contexts it's an absurd assumption, and why in many contexts maybe it's not so bad. Uh, if you're working in a context where it doesn't make sense, uh, you have a few different options. One is the nested logit, which we'll talk very briefly about. Another is the multinomial, multinomial probit, which has some very nice theoretical properties, even though very few people actually estimate the model, for reasons I'll talk about. And finally, I'll say a little bit about the conditional logit, which in some ways is an extension of the standard multinomial, multinomial model. Um, it doesn't get around the assumption of independent, irrelevant alternatives, uh, but it does allow you to handle some situations that the multinomial model doesn't. All right, the multinomial model, um, it's not something you need for everything, uh, but it is a model that where the, the type of the dependent variable is going to drive you straight to it. Uh, there are times when you might want to use instrumental variables or a method called regression discontinuity or another method called difference and difference. Um, those the what drives you to methods like those are flaws, um, cases where the the assumptions of a the normal linear regression model don't hold. Uh, with the models that we're going to talk about today and the models we're going to talk about next time, uh, it's fairly obvious when you need to use them. So for example, if you have a continuous dependent variable, uh, say blood pressure or body mass index or wage, then ordinary least squares or, or the, the linear regression model works completely fine. Okay, in other cases, you might have a binary dependent variable, in which case you might just use the binary logit or probit. Say you're looking at a mortality model or a model where you're trying to decide, trying to understand the determinants of who works and who doesn't, or who retires and who doesn't, or who survives a surgery or who doesn't. Okay. Sometimes you have a situation where your dependent variable, the values are ordered. Say for example, um, on a scale of one to five, how much did you enjoy your doctor's visit? Or on a scale of one to five, how is your health? Those are, that's a case where you've got five different possible values um, they have an ordering, five is better than one, and so forth, but the distance between the units uh, don't really make sense. They're not really defined. There's no reason to think that the distance between a one and a two is the same as the distance between a four and a five. And so you don't want to make assumptions like that. 
uh, in a few weeks, we'll talk about the ordered logit model to handle this sort of case. But today, we're going to focus on this case right here, and that is the multinomial case. That's where you've got outcomes that don't have an obvious ordering. For example, you're trying to model choice of transportation. How do people get to work? Maybe they walk, maybe they bike, maybe they drive or take the bus. Um, there's no natural ordering there. You just want to know how different characteristics of people determine uh, the choice that they make. Similarly, you might be modeling how a particular type of disease based on the characteristics of the patient, characteristics of the doctor, um, drive the type of treatment that's actually used, whether it's surgical, or whether it's a drug, or whether no treatment is, is given at all. And similarly, a treatment outcome, sometimes we think about outcomes as being, well, they can they can survive or they can die, but sometimes there's a third outcome, which is, well, maybe you lost them to follow up and you couldn't track them down. And you want to allow that possibility. Maybe that those people that are lost to follow up are not a random selection and we, they can't just be ignored. Now, with an ordered model, you might be tempted to just run a linear regression on the, the, um, on the scale, say the on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling? But with a multinomial model, most people are not tempted to do that. Even if walking is given a one, and bike is given a two, and drive is given a three, and bus is a four in your data set, it just doesn't make sense to regress that outcome variable um, using a linear regression. There's no reason to think that the age of a person would push up um, the average choice of their mode of transportation by a certain amount. Um, we need to think about it in a very different way. And that's what we're gonna do today with the multinomial model. All right, so what is a multinomial model? Well, we can think about it as a generalization of the binary logit, uh, except instead of just two categories, we've got K categories. But before we dive into that, I would just want to spend a few moments reviewing the binary logit. Now imagine that we're just modeling something simple, whether or not a person likes ice cream. Now, when we have a binary logit, what we're basically doing is we're saying that the log of the odds that the dependent variable is one, in this case, a dependent variable is one, is a person likes ice cream. We're saying the log of those odds is a linear function of the x's. Okay, so here we've just got the one x. You can imagine, if you'd like, that this is just age. And for each year of age, their log odds increase by b. Okay, what's so great about this specification? Well, what's great about it is unlike a plain old probability, okay, um, the log odds actually ranges from minus infinite all the way to plus infinite. So there's no way that we're going to predict out, no matter what x is and no matter what we get for coefficient estimates for a and b, um, there's no way we'll predict out an, an impossible value. Okay. Another nice thing is once we get a predicted log odds, we can always turn that into a probability, okay? Because this right here, the probability of y equaling zero given x is just one minus the probability of y equaling one given x, okay? We can plug that in, okay? If we take the exponential of this whole thing, we get the odds, we can then solve that for the probability, we can get a probability. Okay, this should be review. Okay. The point is, once we have this model, it's not so hard to actually solve for a probability. Now, another nice thing about the binary logit is we have a nice interpretation for this B. Okay. Not only does a one unit increase in X increase the log odds by B, but if we exponentiate b, okay, 
we get something that uh, that we get something called an odds ratio. So suppose we exponentiate b and we get 1.1. Okay, that means that a unit increase in x multiplies the odds of the event happening, in this case, a person liking ice cream, by 1.1. Okay, and we're going to consider that a positive effect on the probability. Now, why does that work? Well, if we exponentiate both sides, that gets rid of the log here, and it turns this into exponential of a times exponential of bx. Okay. Now, let's suppose I wanted to do the same thing, predict out the odds when I increase x by 1 units. I would then get a new odds over here. Okay, so now I would get the probability of y equaling 1 given x plus 1 over probability y equals 0 given x plus 1. Okay, this is my vertical bar. Okay. That's going to be exponential of a plus b times x plus 1. Okay, well that is exponential of a times exponential of bx times exponential of b. Okay, well note this piece right here that's the predicted probability that y is 1 when we just have x. And we're multiplying that by the exponential of b. So when we add 1 to x, the predicted odds are what we got before times exponential of b. Okay. That's just a very quick algebraic explanation for why uh, exponentiating this coefficient gives you an odds ratio or how much we're multiplying the odds um, when we increase x by one unit. Okay, Let's take a look at that. So suppose we regress you know, with a binary logit. Okay, we estimate our binary logit model. Uh, our dependent variable is whether or not they like ice cream. And we're going to put in, on the right-hand side, a dummy variable for female and a set of dummies for socioeconomic status. Now, socioeconomic status is going to be coded as a categorical variable where one is low socioeconomic status, two is middle, and three is high. Uh, when we use a factor variable in Stata, we... Stata creates dummy variables for each of the extra two categories, okay, and enters them into the regression. So what we have here is a logistic model with one binary dependent variable and three, one, two, three, dummy independent variables. And because we use the logistic command instead of the logit command, Stata gives us these odds ratios, the exponentiated uh, regression coefficients instead of just the raw regression coefficients. So let's get to interpreting. What does that 1.949 mean? Well, what it means is that relative to a man, a woman has a woman's odds of liking ice cream are 1.949 times higher, almost twice as high. So women are almost twice as high, uh, as twice as likely, uh, given the odds, based on the odds, uh, to like ice cream. Okay, I should say right now that this is made up data. Okay, I don't know if in fact women like ice cream more than men um, or not. Okay. This regression also tells us that people in middle socioeconomic status are th have 3.3 times higher odds of liking ice cream than people in low with low socioeconomic status. We also notice that the, the relationship is um, 
non-monotonic. So the odds of somebody who's in the highest socioeconomic status, status of liking ice cream are only 1.54 times higher than somebody who's in low socioeconomic status. So they seem like they go up and then they come back down again, although they don't go all the way back down. We can interpret um, the Z statistics and these p-values the same as we would in a regular old linear regression. Uh, in this case, you're testing uh, the hypothesis that the odds ratio is 1. Okay, What happens if exponential of a coefficient is 1? Well, what that means is the coefficient itself is 0. And so we're testing whether or not the coefficient is 0. Does it have any effect on the dependent variable? In this case, we can reject the null that female doesn't matter at all, and we can reject the null that being in the middle category doesn't matter, uh, but we can't reject the null that the high socioeconomic status category likes ice cream any differently than the low socioeconomic status category because our p-value is only 0.162. All right, so moving right along. Now, let's think about, instead of just whether or not someone likes ice cream, let's think about how we would model what type of ice cream someone likes. And so let's assume we live in a world where the only three flavors of ice cream are vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. And we give them, we um, field a survey where we ask everyone in the survey what their favorite is of these three categories. So we have a data set where we've got favorite category, favorite ice cream, so favorite flavor, and the values are either one or two or three corresponding to vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. Now, Instead of the difference in this case between a binary model and a multinomial model, so with a binary model we only have one set of a, one equation, whereas with a multinomial logit model, if we have k categories, okay, we have k minus one equations. So in the binary case, suppose we only have two categories. Well, we have one equation. Okay, that's this. The binary logit is just a special case of the multinomial model. Now, with k minus 1 equations, each equation, instead of modeling the odds of the choice relative to not, okay, you're, we're modeling the odds of a choice relative to a particular baseline. Now, in this example, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that the baseline is strawberry. So we're going to model the odds of a person choosing vanilla relative to strawberry. That's going to be our first equation. And the odds of a person choosing chocolate over strawberry. And that's going to be our second equation. We're going to get k minus 1 sets of coefficients. Okay, Our first set of coefficients is all about how our x's, our independent variables, affect the relative odds of vanilla versus strawberry. And our second set of coefficients is going to tell us how our independent variables affect the relative odds of chocolate versus strawberry. Okay, Just like with a binary logit, we can exponentiate these b's, and they're going to give us relative risk ratios. Okay, we can also call those odds ratios as long as we're clear that it's the odds of one category relative to the base category. So if the exponential, if we exponentiate B1, okay, and we get 1.1, that means an increase of one unit in X multiplies the odds of liking vanilla relative to strawberry by 1.1. 
Now, just like we could solve the binary um, logit model for the pro for a probability, okay? And remember, we had the log of the odds y equals one given x, y equals zero given x. That was a plus b x. Okay, we can solve this equation for this probability, we get this expression right here. So once we estimate this model, we get these nice, um, we get these nice coefficients, which we can we can tell can tell us a lot about how the x's influence our our odds. Okay, we can also use those coefficients to actually predict out probabilities. We can do the same thing with a multinomial logit. What happens there? is we have to solve the whole system of equations for a, for a set of probabilities. The probability of the dependent variable being each one of, our, of the categories, one all the way to k. And each of those probabilities is going to be a function of all the coefficients in the model. Your statistical package, whether it's state or whether it's anything else, was always going to be the one that does these calculations for you. Um, but they're not actually that hard. They're just they're just not just messy. All right. Now imagine that we have data. We run this survey. We have and we have data on 200 high school students, and we want to know how these particular X's affect favorite flavor, okay? And remember favorite flavor was one for vanilla, two for chocolates, and three for strawberry, okay? We have a dummy variable for whether some the student is female. We have our socioeconomic status, our one, two, three for low, medium, and high. And we have one more. We have a continuous independent variable called, which is the writing test score. So we want to know: Do how does being female change uh, the odds of choosing vanilla relative to strawberry? How does socioeconomic status change the odds of choosing, say, chocolate relative to strawberry? And when you have someone with a higher rating test score than another person, how does that change their relative odds of choosing either vanilla or chocolate relative to strawberry? Okay, those are the those are the kinds of questions we can answer by looking at the coefficients that come out of the multinomial logistic regression. So, let's take a look first at just the, the raw um, binary relationships between our variables. So the first thing we'll look at is the relative, the, the distributions for men and for male students and female students uh, in their choices of favorite flavor. Okay, the first thing to notice is that vanilla seems to be the most popular flavor, okay, followed by strawberry uh, and chocolate, which are very evenly matched. Okay, and there's almost no difference between the male preferences for flavors and the female preferences for flavors. Okay. With SES, it's a very different story. We see that among high SES kids, vanilla is by far the most popular flavor. Okay, and similarly, it's actually the most popular flavor for all the groups, but it's far preferred. Um, by the high SES groups relative to the other two categories. Okay, the low SES um, kids are close to indifferent between the three flavors, although they seem to weakly prefer vanilla. When we look at writing score, we see that um, the mean writing score for the kids that prefer vanilla is higher than the mean scores for the other groups. It seems that strawberry um, 
that on average the weaker writing kids uh, prefer strawberry ice cream. Okay, I should tell you that this data, um, well, we'll talk about more about the data, this data in a moment, but suffice it to say, uh, we're not learning anything real here. This is just a, an example. We're not learning anything real about preferences for ice cream flavors among high school kids. All right, so we run our multinomial logit model and we specify that the base category is three, that's strawberry, and that we want relative risk ratios reported. We don't want raw coefficients. We want them exponentiated. And we get a, um, a pretty big table coming out. Okay, we get uh, a set of coefficients in the first panel Okay, right here, these are telling us about preferences for chocolate relative to strawberry, and these are telling us about preferences for vanilla relative to strawberry. So we can see that being female seems to have the odds of preferring chocolate to strawberry, okay, relative to male, but it's not significantly different from from no effect at all okay if we go over here to the SES categories we can see that uh, people in the middle group the middle SES group have much lower odds of preferring chocolate to strawberry than the low SES kids and if we go to writing score uh, there does seem to be a significant effect. It seems that as writing score increases, as write, if writing score increases by one unit, that multiplies the odds of preferring chocolate to strawberry. Okay, for any particular kid, as the writing as the writing score goes up. Okay, we see bigger effects when we look at vanilla to strawberry, where we still don't see much. For vanilla, um, for female, okay. But when we look at high SES, being high SES relative to low SES multiplies your odds by about 2.2, which seems like a huge effect. Even so, not significant. The biggest effect on the table in terms of significance is right here. Each point of writing score multiplies the odds of preferring vanilla to strawberry by 1.1. Okay, writing score definitely seems to push people toward vanilla relative to strawberry. Okay, more so than it pushes students to chocolate relative to strawberry. It seems to be writing higher writing scores seem to be pushing people away from liking strawberry ice cream. All right, I should also say that Interpreting these coefficients, it takes a lot of practice. I recommend you maybe pause the video and try to interpret them on your own and go back and replay and make sure that you're, you're getting it right. Okay, this stuff takes practice. All right, let's talk about testing. Okay, we talked a little bit when we looked at this table about how we might test individual coefficients and what that would mean. Okay. If we could reject the hypothesis that the effect of writing um, was to multiply the odds by one, so there was no effect of writing, okay, that would be interesting. Okay, but we might also wonder other things too. Okay, we might wonder if there's really any effect of SES on the odds at all. In other words, we might want to test are these coefficients and these coefficients totally meaningless? That is, are the exponentiated versions that we're looking at, can we reject that the true versions are actually equal to one or that the raw, raw coefficients are equal to zero in all four cases? 
okay, those, those two things are the same. Exponentiated coefficients all equal to one, or raw coefficients all equal to zero. So if we want to know whether or not the coefficients are all meaningless, can we reject the fact that the raw coefficients are all equal to zero? What we have to do is run the following test command in Stata. Now here, the numbers are referring to the particular variables. So this is dummy variable corresponding to SES category two, which is middle, and SES category three, which is high. And what Stata does is it takes that and then it tests whether or not those coefficients are equal to zero in all of the equations. Okay, and so it does that, and these are the omitted, so we ignore those, and we pay attention to these. Okay, and in fact, we can reject that they're all equal to zero. It seems there's some effect, we're not sure what it is, we can't really identify exactly what it is. None of the individual coefficients are significant, but we cannot reject that they're all zero. Similarly, we might want to know, is it possible that in the population, the effect of being female, okay, is the same on the contrast between chocolate and strawberry and vanilla and strawberry? That is, is the coefficient on female in each of the two equations, okay, that's estimated here and here, can we reject that that's the same? So does being, is it possible that being female multiplies the odds of preferring chocolate to strawberry by the same number as it multiplies the odds of liking vanilla relative to strawberry? Okay, we specify the equation by putting its name in brackets and then the variable name, okay? And in this case, those coefficients estimates are so similar that we just can't reject the possibility that the true coefficients are also the same. Now, I said that predicting probabilities was pretty easy, although a little messy. Uh, all it takes is a little bit of algebra on those original equations I showed you. Uh, in Stata, we can predict out probabilities using the margins command. Okay, suppose what we wanted to do was really isolate the effect of SES on um, choice of ice cream flavor. One thing we can do is look closely at those coefficients. Those coefficients, they're a little tricky to interpret. Uh, and if you're trying to communicate what your, your findings to people that don't know a lot about multinomial models, a lot of times what you might want to do is predict out probabilities, okay? That's what we're gonna do here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, what's the probability, what does the model predict is the probability for, in this case, outcome one, uh, which is vanilla, so this is vanilla, for each of the SES categories. Now, what do we do with the other variables? Well, we hold them constant at their mean values. So what does the model predict is the probability of somebody liking vanilla ice cream when they're in the lowest SES category and we hold their writing score equal to 52.775, which is the mean, and we hold the female dummy variable at its mean, which is 0.545. So this is different from looking at the actual averages, um, the proportion of people that picked vanilla for in the low SES kids in the survey, okay? Because what we're doing is those low SES kids in the survey, maybe they were disproportionately, had dis disproportionately different um, or maybe they had on average different writing scores than the high SES kids. And it's the SES, it's the writing scores that are driving the differences. 
Well, here what we're going to do is we're going to hold the writing score constants and predict out with the model only varying SES. Okay, and what we find is that the low SES kids have a much higher probability of choosing vanilla than the high SES kids. The high SES kids are not choosing vanilla at nearly the rates uh, that the low SES kids are, netting out the effect of writing test or potentially sex effects that might be correlated uh, in the um, observed data. Okay, That's the margins command. Now, you might have a problem with this. You might not like plugging in a value of 0.545 for female, okay, because, well, I don't know very many people that would report that they're 54.5% female. Uh, I know a lot more people that would either report that they are or aren't, okay? And so another way to get at this is to take each person in the data. So take all 200 people in the data, and for each one of them, set SES equal to 1 and see what the model predicts would be their favorite flavor. And then take the average. And then do that same exercise, and that will give you a difference, but very similar actually, estimate for the predicted um, probability of choosing vanilla ice cream. And then do the same exercise, setting everyone equal to the highest SES category and predicting out for their given writing score and their given sex what the model says, and then taking that average. And that's what happens when you do this margins command, but not specifying, without specifying at means. Okay? And you get very similar numbers. Note that before our predicted value, our predicted value in this method is 0.336. Over here it was 0.364. Okay. The predicted value for the mill SES group is 0.229 when we evaluate these at the mean values of the other X's. And here it's 0.206. So it's not a very big difference. And I will say that just like using this method is um, c considered better these days uh, in a linear probability context, it's also considered better these days in a multinomial logistic model context. All right. Often you'll want not just these numbers, but you want pictures, okay? Because journals like pictures. Um, pictures are often easier to and, um, pour into a, a reader's mind than a table of numbers. Okay, so these commands right here actually take the pictures that we, the numbers that we just generated a second ago and put them in some pictures. And we see at this point, shouldn't be very surprising, that the most popular flavor for the high group is vanilla by a lot, okay? And also it's that it's the most popular flavor for all the groups, okay? It's just even more popular for the higher group, okay? Um, the high group doesn't seem to enjoy chocolate uh, or vanilla much at all, okay? And again, note that these numbers are different from the, the raw averages that we looked at earlier in that they net out any um, effects that might be driven by sex or writing score. All right, now let me make a confession. Okay, the data we're looking at is actually um, based on real data. Okay, it comes from the high school and beyond survey and it's about how high school students choose the type of high school program that they're in, okay? So everything that we just did is actually, um, instead of about vanilla and chocolate and strawberry, it's actually about uh, general programs 
uh, actually, chocolate was general, academic is vanilla, okay, and vocational was strawberry. And so, on the one hand, I find that to be a fairly dry topic, and it's a lot more fun to talk about ice cream flavors. Okay, I feel like it relaxes people to talk about ice cream flavors in a way it doesn't relax people to talk about types of high schools. Uh, on the other hand, the intuition makes a lot more sense when we think about it this way. So high SES uh, kids, far more likely to choose academic relative to the other groups, the other types of programs um, than the low SES kids. Okay, getting a higher writing score increases your odds of choosing the academic track relative to the other tracks. Okay, if you want to take a look at this data, you can actually download it from the UCLA website here, uh, and you can actually read their walkthrough of analyzing using Stata to analyze the same. Um, data as um, high school program high school program choice uh, at this website right here. All right, now it's time to talk about the big assumption that sits behind every multinomial logistic model. It's called independence of irrelevant alternatives, and what it says is that the relative odds of, of an outcome J relative to outcome K don't depend on what the other outcomes are, okay? What other choices are available, okay? The relative choice has nothing to do with the total set that are available. Sounds kind of innocuous. It's not actually so innocuous. So let's think about it in terms of ice cream. So what it says is that the rel it, pr it predicts that the relative proportions of students who pick chocolate and strawberry won't change when vanilla runs out, okay? So if you've got an equal number of kids choosing chocolate and strawberry when vanilla's around, okay? What that says is that when vanilla runs out, you're still going to have an equal number choosing chocolate and strawberry. So those kids that preferred vanilla, they're no different from the kids that didn't like vanilla and chose equally between chocolate and strawberry. Okay, It can't be the case that all the kids who love vanilla would then choose chocolate as their second, make chocolate their second choice. Okay, That would violate the assumption, even though that's something that very well might be true. Um, when Dan McFadden originally developed this model, okay, he did it in the context of transportation choice, and he gave an example. It's called the red bus, blue bus example. So suppose that initially people are just choosing between two options. They can get to school uh, by driving, okay, taking a car, or they can hop on the red bus. And one third of people, they tend to ride the red bus. Okay, so for one third of people, that's their that's their choice, and two thirds of people, their choice is the car. And so, the odds of choosing car relative to red bus are two to one. Now, suppose a new possibility shows up. Okay, it's just like the red bus. It's a blue bus that follows the red bus everywhere. So everywhere where the red bus stops, the blue bus is right behind it and stops. Okay. Suppose that one quarter of the population just prefers the blue bus to the red bus or the car. Okay. The independence of irrelevant alternatives assumption says that now the breakdown has to be one quarter of the people choose the red bus, one quarter choose the blue bus, and half the people choose the car. Okay, that is, it has to be that way so that 
the number of people that choose car relative to red bus stays two to one. Okay, that doesn't make any sense because all those people that were choosing car, they should continue to want to choose car. They prefer car to bus. Just because the bus is red or, or because the bus is blue shouldn't make them change their mind, okay? If a quarter of the people are going to switch to blue, it's got to be just the, it's got to be the people that were already choosing um, the red bus. that They would switch over to the blue bus. So what you might think would actually happen is that maybe there'd be a, maybe there'd be a split among the red bus, among the red bus customers. Half of them would then switch to the blue bus and the same number of people who were picking car before are still picking car. But now the odds of car to red bus have changed to four to one. Okay. So if this is how we think people work, Okay, if this is a situation where that's how we think the preferences would change, then the multinomial logit model is not doing a very good job of capturing that. Okay. Now, this happens because in the multinomial model, we have these different equations and they have different error terms, and we assume that the error terms in the different equations are actually independent, and there's no reason to think that they're always going to be independent. Sometimes they're highly correlated. So those unobserved things that might push someone to a blue bus or to a, to a bus relative to a car, okay? Well, the things that drive them to the red bus are going to be very, very similar to the things that would drive them to a blue bus, okay? And the multinomial logit model doesn't take that into account. So what's the, what's the takeaway here? So the first takeaway is whenever you have, you've estimated a model, a choice model with a set of choices and you're going to apply it to choices that people make where they, they have a subset of the choices available. So for example, we, we estimate our, our model of um, ice cream flavor choice with three flavors and then we use it to predict how people will behave when there are only two flavors available that's dangerous okay so you have to be careful in those situations okay second in McFadden's words the multinomial model or the IIA assumption is reasonable when you have alternatives that can quote be plausibly assumed to be distinct and weighted independently in the eyes of each decision maker. That's tough to parse. Okay. But in this case, red bus, blue bus, and car, it's clear that these are not relatively can equal choices. Okay. If it was a walk bus car, you might be able to make that, that argument. It sure would be nice if we had statistical tests of the independent independence of a relevant alternatives assumption. Um, those tests tend to, to not to have very nice statistical properties. And so people generally don't rely on them instead cross their fingers and hope that the, the II assumption is reasonable and violations of it um, won't bite them, okay? And people are very careful uh, about using um, estimates of a choice model in contexts where you have a, a more limited set of choices available. Now, suppose you you're stuck and you still you have a situation where you have you want to estimate the choice model you know that the independence of irrelevant alternatives assumptions violated and you want a more general model well at that point it's time to leave the world of the multinomial logit 
and move to an alternative. Uh, the most common alternative is called the nested logit. I'm just going to talk about these three methods, the nested logit and then multinomial probit and the conditional logit very briefly just so you know they ex just so you know kind of that they're out there I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on them uh, but the nested logit model is a model where the decisions are sequential okay first you decide whether to take car or bus and then after that you decide whether to take the red bus or the blue bus okay so the relative odds of the red bus or the blue bus are invariant to whether a car is available, and that might be totally reasonable. Now, another type of nested logit, or another um, context I've seen people use the nested logit is in birth control models, where first people are decide where first someone will decide whether to use birth control, and second they'll decide whether to use uh, what type of birth control to use, say a condom or the pill. Okay, it's not clear if this is this is okay. Um, because in this case, what you're saying is whether the choice of whether to use contraception or not doesn't depend on what methods you have available. And that is probably not reasonable. Okay, now, the multinomial probit model is considered the holy grail of choice models okay it's in some ways it's similar to the multinomial logit but it allows all of the error terms to be arbitrarily correlated with each other so you end up with a very large number of parameters to estimate you have to estimate the correlations of the error terms in each of your choice equations with all of the other uh, error terms okay unfortunately it's very very hard to get precise estimates of all of these coefficients uh, you end up with pretty big standard errors on them even when you have very large samples um, if you're interested in more about to learn if you want to learn more about this I highly recommend Mike Keen's 1992 paper it's called a note on identification in the multinomial probit model and it's technical, but I think uh, it's also very well written and makes the case um, makes a very strong case that these models they they sound great, um, but they're just not practical. And then finally, the conditional logit does something a little bit different. Uh, what it does is it allows the choices that individuals make in your sample. Um, to be different. So it allows the properties of the choices to differ across individuals. So you might have a model where people are choosing how to travel and their choices are whether it's a bus, a car, or a bike. And you want that choice is going to be driven by characteristics of the individuals doing the choosing. So for example, age and sex. But the characteristics of those choices might differ uh, for the different people. So buses might vary by varying costs. Um, cars might vary by cost and bikes might vary by cost. Uh, travel time might vary for the different um, different choices for different people. And so the conditional logit, it's a more complex model. But it can be very useful if that's something that you need to, to account for. All right, so now it's your turn. And what I'd like you to do next is download the alligators.dta data file. Um, it's a file that contains information. This is a classic uh, information from a paper by Agresti written in 1990. And it is a classic, um, it's classic da test data for estimating multinomial models. Okay, you have data on 219 alligators. Uh, these alligators lived in, each one lived in one of four different lakes. Okay, and each of these alligators, um, a scientist looked in their belly to see what their last meal was. 
and those meals are categorized in five categories and that's the dependent variable that you're going to look at um, and the alligators themselves uh, some are large and some are small okay and so that's going to be uh, dummy large is going to be a dummy variable food is going to be a five category categorical variable that's going to be your dependent variable and lake is going to be a four category um, independent variable so what I'd like you to do is pause the video download that data and estimate a model that predicts food choice and then come be ready to to kind of think about um, be ready to explain um, what your model actually uh, says about uh, alligator diets and then come back and then I'll talk about um, what you might have found all right welcome back uh, I hope that the first thing you did was take a close look at just the overall aggregate distribution of, of food choice by these alligators uh, because what you'll find is that 43% um, of them eat fish uh, invertebrates uh, I think that's things like um, crabs snails um, bugs those make up uh, the primary choice of almost 30% of the alligators uh, many of the alligators are eating reptiles many of them are eating birds uh, and then there's a mix of all different other uh, types of foods that foods they might be eating eggs including mammals and vegetables who knows what else fits into the other category okay but what we're trying to get at is how does the lake that they live in determine the primary food choice and how does the size of the alligator determine the primary food choice and what you what I hope you did is estimate a straightforward multinomial logit model where your dependent variables food and your independent variables are the uh, the large dummy variable and the dummies corresponding to the values of the lake categorical variable and what we find is that um, relative to relative to the small alligators the large ones are much less likely to be eating invertebrates okay that seems to be something that the small alligators do in multiple being large multiplies your odds by 0.23. So one quarter the size, less than a quarter the size of choosing to eat an invertebrate over a fish. Okay? The larger alligators, on the one hand, they seem much more likely to eat reptiles over fish. Okay? And multiply the odds by 1.42. On the other hand, we can't reject that there's no effect at all that the true exponentiated coefficient is one okay we just don't have enough data um, on reptiles to really say that uh, lake certainly is having big significant effects uh, in lake two they seem to be much more likely in fact all of these lakes much more likely to eat invertebrates than fish relative to uh, what's going on in lake one Okay. Okay. More of the same with these other categories. Uh, sure would be nice to actually get a handle on some predicted probabilities, um, holding other things constant to see what the effect of maybe maybe all of the large alligators were in one lake. Um, maybe all the small alligators were in one lake. What we really like to know is. Uh, what the distributions are of food choice holding um, by one category holding the other category fixed okay and that's what this does okay we can do that here uh, since we're going to hold lake constant what we need to do is we're going to we need to create dummy variables um, 
for lake one, two, three, and four. Then we put them in instead of using factor variables, put them in right into the regression. Run the regression and then set them all equal to their mean values. Then predict out uh, the probability for fish, invertebrate, reptile, bird, and other for every observation in the data. That's going to be the small um, alligators as well as the large alligators. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do graph bar. Okay, and that's going to that's going to graph out um, the probabilities for each of the possible values of the dependent variable over large, which means it's going to, we're going to do this separately for the small alligators and the large alligators. Uh, we wrapped this whole thing up between a preserve and a restore. So we say preserve, we set lake to equal to the mean for all of these um, alligators in our data sets. We predict out and when we restore, we go back to where we were before, okay, which is putting the lake variables back to what they were before. All right, so what do we get? Okay, so what we have here is our small and our large alligators, these are the distributions of their diets. So what we can see is that the large ones eat a lot more fish. They eat a lot more reptiles. They eat a lot more birds. And they eat about the same other and they eat a lot less invertebrates. Okay, so it's the differences that we observed, the raw differences that we observed in their diets um, hold up. It wasn't simply that the large alligators happened to be um, not in the lakes with a lot of invertebrates, that it was really in all the lakes, it seems like the large alligators were eating fewer invertebrates and more of everything else. Okay, now what if we want to look by lake? We play the same game. Okay, we have our lake variables, we preserve, we set large equal to the mean, we predict out, and we graph this time over lake. And so we get a very similar picture, except now we have stacked bar graphs for each of the four lakes. Turns out that one of the lakes uh, is pretty light on invertebrates, and that does not seem to have anything to do with the fact it doesn't seem like it's because that lake had a lot of large alligators in it. Okay, it seems that just just the large and the small alligators were both eating a lot fewer invertebrates in Hancock Lake. Okay, again, this is I want to keep going back to why are we bothering to use this fancy method? Um, what is it buying us that something simpler like just looking at the distributions of food choice across the lakes? Why can't we just do that? Okay. It's all about teasing out effects and netting out the effects of, of other things that might be driving them. Okay. All right. So what have we learned from this lecture? Well, we've learned that you should use multinomial models when you have multinomial dependent variables. So that is categorical variables with no natural ordering. Okay, We've learned that a multinomial logit, it's actually a pretty straightforward extension of the binary logit. Uh, we reviewed the binary logit and we went over both the intuition and the math behind the multinomial model. Uh, we talked about how to estimate it. You should be able to do this with Stata now. You should be able to test hypotheses about your coefficients. You should be able to interpret your coefficients. 
and you should be able to use your model to make predictions about probabilities. We've talked about the key assumption underlying the multinomial log logistic model, and that is independence of irrelevant alternatives and when you should really worry about it, in particular using your model uh, for prediction in contexts where there's a, set, a different set of choices available. Okay, and we've talked very briefly about three alternatives to a plain vanilla multinomial model. And those are the nested logit, the multinomial logit, and the conditional logit. Uh, if you want to learn more, I highly recommend uh, Jeremy Fries and Scott Long's book about uh, uh, categorical dependent variable um, analysis using Stata. And let's stop there.